And here he is, John Jansen. It's great to talk with him on this Monday. John, thanks so much for joining us. I'm going to jump right in and talk about uh, your your favorite position, the offensive line. And, you know, this year it appears to be very deep. Now, you want the best five for sure. Uh, do you want to have those game week after training camp, or can it spill into the season, you think? Well, Here's what I, I want to have from this offensive line. Yeah, coming out of training camp, you want to have a starting five, a, a five that have worked together because there's going to be some new parts. Obviously, you know, Hayes is no longer there, and um, you're going to have – you've got Ladarius uh, Henderson who's coming in uh, as a transfer. You know, you've got uh, uh, Miles Hinton coming in as a transfer. I'm sure they're going to be part of the conversation, especially Ladarius. Uh, but then inside, uh, you know, you're going to have a new center uh, no matter what happens because Olu has moved on. So is it going to be Drake Nugent um, at center? Probably Greg Crippen, his backup. But the beautiful thing about this offensive line and the great thing that I've noticed since Sharon Moore has taken over as offensive line coach, he does a great job during the week of practice and during training camp of working guys in, knowing who his five are going to be. But if Zinter goes down, hey, who's going to be that guy that goes in there? It's probably going to be Giovanni Alhadi at either guard position. Last year when he went in, you never noticed anything in terms of a drop-off. There was never a timeout. It was just, hey, you plug and play. And that's going to be the beautiful thing about this offensive line is that it's all plug and play. They could go eight, nine, ten deep and have no drop-off in production. Yeah, I like you talking about that depth. I was starting to look at it, you know, four deep at tackle. You know, you want to make a case for three, four at guard, maybe center too. Now, I don't remember any team ever rotating an entire offensive line or playing them in shifts or anything like that. Uh, but if you were to do that, John, you know, just if it's you're kind of crazy, you wanted to be the first one. Uh, how do you think you would go about doing that one series? If you had a, a, a long pass play where guys were running, you, you know, you'd have maybe a, a, a word where, Hey, let's get the other guys in, let them run a, a play or two. I mean, I know that sounds kind of crazy, but if you were going to do it, what are the kind of things that you would think about? Well, I do think that early on in this schedule, because the teams, I mean, let's face it, the teams, there's not going to be great competition. And you want to get guys a lot of experience. It could very well be like a hockey shift change. Now, it's not going to be in the middle of a play. <laughs> but, you know, you could shuffle those, those units in and out. It would be, for me as an offensive line coach, it would be more of a feel. Um, you know, are the guys that are in there right now, if the first unit is in there, have they had a chance to get a rhythm going? Have they had enough opportunity to get experience and, and see enough looks? So probably two, maybe three series. And then I would put the other guys in, you know, unit number two and do the same thing. I want to make sure that they get into a rhythm. Uh, and and make sure that they see a few things, a few blitzes. They've got to communicate. Maybe they get into a third and long or a short yardage situation. I want to be able to see those things. You never know what's going to happen, but if you can, you know, if you can manufacture some of those throughout the course of a game, uh, then that would be ideal, especially in those first three. And I'll even throw in Rutgers uh, that that first Big Ten game, those first four games. I think you'll see a lot of both units. Oh, you're going to throw in Rutgers, too. I, I like that. John Jansen, you hear him uh, about every other day on the MGO Blue podcast, every day on the radio, during the Michigan football season, uh, during the games, of course, as he's the, the color analyst. Uh, you know, John, I'd never seen uh, Harbaugh go with the plan last year like he did a quarterback with McNamara in game one and then McCarthy in game two. So, you know, a, kind of a free-for-all and, you know, the schedule – allowed that. So you already mentioned it. So you could see the possibility, you know, maybe not even that offensive line uh, that, you know, all the positions are, are unique and you, know, you can't, you're not going to hit the quarterbacks in camp, you know, the offensive line, I would imagine going against the Michigan defensive line, you're going to get a pretty good test, but you know, could you see the, you know, McNamara McCarthy plan being used by Harbaugh this year? Um, well, in, in regards to, 
reps and experience yet in regards to, um, you know, what the final result is. And that is, you know, finding out who your starting quarterback. No, it's going to be J.J. McCarthy. But, yeah, um, I think J.J. will be your starter every single game. You're not going to have, uh, you know, a starter for game two. But you will see a lot of Davis Warren. You will see probably Jack Tuttle. You're going to see Alex Orgy because you never know what's going to happen throughout the course of a year. And you want to make sure that those guys do have game experience. They've got, they've seen everything at live speed. They've taken a couple of hits uh, and, and they've had to improvise out on the field. Um, you know, it's the same thing at running back. You, you know that Blake Corum, Donovan Edwards, that's going to be running back 1A and, and, and 1B, but you don't want to get them beat up through the course of the year. But you also want to develop some experience and some game reps for some of the other guys. So you're going to see Ben Benjamin Hall, which who I you know coming out of spring ball, I I fell in love with. I think he's going to be a terrific talent. You got Cole Cabana. You've got a lot of guys, Davy Dunlap, that can get in there and take some reps off of the starters, but also develop experience because you never know when somebody's going to be called on. It's interesting, John. Uh, how do you, what's the sweet spot? You know, you can have a plan and then you get hit in the mouth and it's a close game and everything's different, but you know, so you're going to let the game, the time and the score dictate so much about, you know, who's going to play. But if you want to get uh, the backups in, uh, is there, you know, you, you say, Hey, let's get them into the first series in the third quarter. Uh, are, are you coming up with a plan to get them, you know, maybe you sprinkle them in there in the second. I know this is kind of like that question earlier, but, you know, the starters want to play. Guys want to put up numbers. And you do want to get them ready for the conference season. So I know these conversations are had. I mean, there's not one, you know, uh, exact answer for this. But, you know, when, when you, you've you got a lot of guys that you want to play and you got this kind of schedule, you know, what do you think those kind of conversations are like for the staff? Well, when it comes, it's going to be kind of position specific. Like I mentioned about the offensive line, you could see them rotating in and out throughout the course of a game. Um, but in regards to, hey, our, our, our first offensive unit, there's a lot of value to be had in going into the locker room, making a few adjustments, talking about the pictures that you're seeing, seeing some video, making those adjustments, and then coming out in the second half and performing those adjustments. Um, that's a, that's a skill that can be learned and, and guys need to become comfortable coming out of halftime, making some of those adjustments. And then after that first possession of the second half, I could see, you know, it, it could be a musical chairs at almost every position on the, on the field, depending on, you know, the, the, the score and, and if the game is, is well in hand and, um, it, but it's really going to be position specific at wide receiver you see guys rotating in and out all the time. So to see some of the younger guys get some early reps, that wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility. Same thing at running back, tight end position. Um, But the quarterback position, I think that's going to be one where you're going to see one. And then once, Hey, once JJ's done, he's done for the day. You're not going to, he's not going to be coming back off of the bench. I haven't played musical chairs in close to 50 years, but I like you bringing it up, thinking about it for, uh, early September. John, let me, with the couple minutes that I have left, let me ask you specifically about some guys. Uh, Trent a. Jones, he's a, a three-time academic All-Big Ten guy. So he's smart. He's had eight starts. And I've noticed when I've gone back, I'm not breaking down the film or anything, but I'll re-watch a game. And a lot of times I'll look, I'll say, who's that big guy way downfield? And I'll look and I'll say, it's 53. Uh, if you know 53 at right tackle, what do you like about him? He, he seems like he could have a, a a fantastic season. It seems like his best football could be in front of him right now. Yeah, and he was off to a pretty good start last year. Um, then obviously had the ankle injury and missed some time, and uh, and then worked his way back into the lineup. And yeah, there's there's a difference between book smart and football smart. And here's <laughs> yeah. where I want to see his progression is anticipating what that defensive lineman is going to be doing in front of him. There's no better athlete on that offensive line. There's as good, but no better athlete than Trent A. Jones. He bends well. He moves well. He's got good lateral speed. He can set an anchor, uh, you know, change of directions all there. And you mentioned getting downfield. That's all part of the equation, but I want to be able to see him anticipate 
hey, when there's a linebacker lurking around behind my defensive end, what does that tell me? Where is my guy going? There were a couple of times last year where I see him, you know, get beat across his face, and it was simply because it's not that he can't block him. It's that he didn't anticipate that move, and he allowed a little penetration on the inside gap. So if he can shore up those things, uh, that would go a long way into him solidifying a start spot. Uh, two quick ones for you. Carson Barnhart, I had a former player last week in the, or last year in the middle of the season, you know, telling me, you know, he's kind of the weak link on that line. It's why JJ can't get the time to throw the ball down the field. And then I talked with him at the end of the season. He said, man, that guy really took off midway through the season and elevated his play. I mean, how legit is, is Carson Barnhart a 52 at tackle? Oh, I mean, as legit as it gets. I mean, this is a guy that is the ultimate competitor. And he's, you know, business of college football is when a guy like a Miles Hitt or a Ladarius Henderson comes here from the transfer portal, what does that mean about guys that, you know, already were starters? Do they get bumped back? And if they do, why don't they transfer? They could be starting anywhere else in the country. Carson Parkhart is as big of a competitor as you're going to find. And I think it's very hard to think of an offensive line, a starting five that doesn't include Carson Barnhart. And then you talk about his improvements last year during the season. Um, all of, That's all a part of, of the consciousness of him, of understanding what he needs to improve upon, how to get better. And he did all of those things in the season last year. He's done even more so in the off season, and I think he's poised for for a great year. And on this offensive line, I think you're looking at you know uh, seven or eight guys, and you'd have to go back to you know shoot when I played, um, and you you know you start talking about lines with you know uh, uh, Backus, Hutch, myself, uh, and you know you go down the list of guys that were NFL players. You got Ladarius Henderson. I see the NFL in his future. Carson Barnhart, Trent Day Jones, Miles Hinton. Um, and then you go inside. We know Keegan and Zinter uh, have NFL aspirations, and they're going to get that chance. Drake Nugent. I mean, you go down the list, and there's there's eight or nine guys that are on the lot roster right now, and maybe more, mm. that are going to be playing on Sunday. So that's how difficult – this competition will be to figure out who's going to be that starting five. But again, I find it very hard to believe that there's a starting five without Carson Barnhart as a part of it. John, you're firing me up. I'm ready for football right now. I got two questions for you. You can take them really quick or you can answer them as long as you want, whatever it is. Earlier, you mentioned Giovanni El Hade. I would think that he would be in that conversation. Maybe if he keeps progressing, he seems like he's got all the tools. You already mentioned that there wasn't a drop off when he was in there for either Keegan or Zinter. Where do you see El Hadi's ceiling? Um, well, I see his ceiling is he, he could be a, uh, you know, an early draft choice. And an, I don't think he's a first round type of guy, but I could see him in the second, early third. Um, and that's where you see a lot of guys that play that guard position. Um, you know, just because the value guys, the, the, the high – ceiling guys or tackles they're going to go in the first round but he's got all that potential and you know that's going to be the difficult thing you know there's two incumbents uh in Keegan and Zinter at those guard spots but they both missed time due to injury he's going to have his time his chance to shine uh in there at the guard position this year and then when those guys leave you know he's going to step in there and be an absolute stud uh at the guard position so uh, his ceiling is as high as he wants to make it. He could be, he could have a long career in the NFL. He's got the body, he's got the mental makeup for it, and he's got the discipline uh, in, in, re, in regards to honing in on his technique. I love it. My final question for you is about Sharon Moore. He's going to be the offensive coordinator this year. He's not going to have to share those duties. So he's calling the plays for better or for worse. I feel like you're a perfect person to ask this because since you were done playing, you spent all of those years down on the sideline. And then this last year you were up in the booth. So Sharon Moore dealing with the offensive line, he's been down on the field. Do you think it's, you know, John, it's probably his feel, but you, you feel like 
as a play caller and an offensive line coach, is it you 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 get a better feel from down on the field, or is it up in the booth, or you think he'll try those out early in the season and see which one he likes best? Well, I mean, he's in a unique position because not only is he the play caller, but he's also the offensive line coach. So um, every coach, every play caller is going to have their preference in regards to whether they like to call plays and see the big picture from above or if they're good at calling it from the field. And I would I would anticipate that Jerome Moore is going to be calling the game from the field. He's got reliable eyeballs. Uh, and great coaches that are going to be up in the booth. And whether it's uh, Kirk Campbell, the new quarterback coach, uh, you know, it, it's going to be a number of different guys that are going to be able to tell him what he needs to know from up above. I think he's got a good grasp on making the play call, seeing things from the field, but also making sure that it's not just calling the plays, it's being tuned into what his offensive line needs. I mean, you got two Joe Moore award-winning offensive lines back-to-back, this could be the third, and he's going to want to be hands-on for that as well. Great job, John. Did you read that 97 book yet? You got a I have, of it? I've, read, I've read most of it. Um, it's, going to be, it's going to be a lot of fun for – there are things I learned in that book from my teammates that I had no idea – Almost every single guy was interviewed. There's going to be a lot of perspe- different perspectives on that season, a lot of different stories. Um, and I think fans are really going to enjoy uh, listening to uh, and reading about that season. It was such a memorable moment in my life and in Michigan fans' lives uh, that it's going, to be, uh, it's going to be a big hit. Yeah, very memorable season. John, thanks so much for your time. Continued success. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's great to have you on. And uh, and take care. Dennis, thanks for having me. And uh, as always, go blue. All right, we'll see you. There he is, John Jansen.